Okay, we are with uh, Osam El Malawi, independent journalist and activist uh, of Egypt. Yeah, okay. and uh, we are going to ask him uh, like something about, of course, uh, uh, the so-called Arab uh, Spring uh, in Cairo. And uh, the first question is like, uh, how you feel as like uh, an independent journalist, uh, blogger, an activist, uh, all the, the, re the revolutionary process that takes place in uh, Egypt? Um, I'm, I'm honored to be speaking to you. My name is uh, Hussam Al-Hamalawi. I'm a journalist and I'm an activist with the Egyptian Revolutionary Socialist uh, Movement, which is um, like the biggest uh, organization in the radical left uh, in Egypt. Um, I've been a journalist uh, since 2002 and I've been in the blogging scene since uh, 2006. Um, when it comes to the situation of the uh, freedom of press and when it comes to the freedom of writing, uh, definitely we've come a long way um, um, over the past uh, 10 years or from the time I started working uh, as a journalist in 2002 where you couldn't write anything about Mubarak or you couldn't write anything about the police uh, or the army. But uh, increasingly over the years we've been pushing those uh, censorship lines uh, and lifting up the ceiling um, uh, bit by bit. And uh, I have to admit that it was mainly the social media that was pushing um, uh, the boundaries uh, uh, and mainstream media was following uh, suit. Um, after the uprising, the 18-day 18 18 day uprising that we had, um, you have a contradictory process where on the one hand of course now you can write anything you want about uh, Hosni Mubarak you can uh, write anything you want about the Egyptian police but when it comes to the army the army is still uh, a big taboo in uh, in Egyptian politics and the army is trying to reinforce the same censorship uh, methods as uh, before the revolution whether it's by uh, summoning uh, journalists and bloggers um, uh, to the military prosecutor and I personally was summoned uh, last May um, or by imprisonment or uh, attacks against journalists and photographers um, uh, during protests and during uh, activist events um, however at the same time um, this should not be a reason for us to get depressed or to feel that the revolution is over because it's not over it's only starting I mean uh, those 18 day uh, uprising uh, we're basically phase one of the Egyptian revolution and now we're pushing with phase two which is uh, the mass labor strikes in order to oust uh, Mubarak's army generals. Okay, uh, can you explain uh, for us Italians what was the role of the army in, uh, in uh, these 18 days of the revolution uprising? Yeah? The Egyptian army had tried to um, sell the idea that uh, they protected the revolution by by not shooting at protesters like what happened in Libya or Syria uh, and Libya and Syria are being used as like boogeymen you know in order to scare the public um, and to try to drive them into appreciation of the army's position uh, the army is trying to claim in its propaganda that they sided with the protesters but this is a complete lie um, the Egyptian army has been the backbone of the dictatorship uh, since 1952, since uh, Nasser's coup, coup d'etat, uh, which took place in July 1952. Uh, the army controls from 25% to 40% of our economy. Uh, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, which is currently the ruling institutional body uh, in Egypt, is headed by Mubarak's loyal Minister of Defense, uh, uh, Tantrawi, and uh, those army generals uh, in SCAF, or the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, they have been handpicked and chosen by Hosni Mubarak himself based on their loyalty. So there is no question for us about where, uh, where the army really stands. Now the question here is, why didn't they shoot at protesters in the same way that they did uh, in Libya or Syria? And the answer is very simple. If they had done that, the army would have collapsed immediately. Um, you don't have one army in Egypt, you have two armies. There is the army of the uh, generals, there is the army of the high-ranking officers, and there is the army of the conscripts who are just former, uh, or like they are farmers and uh, workers in uniform, who get conscripted and abused in the army from one to three years, 
we have a complicated conscription system. Uh, in addition to the young officers who are just fresh out of the military college, they are uh, badly paid, they can see the corruption uh, in the army, they look up and they see their generals uh, definitely in a completely different position from where they are. And the generals understood well that if they had given them orders uh, uh, to shoot at protesters in Tahrir, they wouldn't have done it. They would have obeyed, disobeyed the orders. There would have been mutiny. Um, but if you look at the 18 days, the army did not protect us in Tahrir. They stood aside uh, on the day of uh, the Battle of the Camel, you know, on the 2nd of February, when Mubarak's thugs sent in, uh, when, when the Mubarak's NDP, the National Democratic Party, sent in uh, their own thugs, uh, mounting horses and camels and uh, wielding swords and uh, wielding guns and knives, the army just stood by watching and they were hoping that, uh, that the thugs would finish us off. It's some of the army officers uh, in the square, they reacted to the thugs but they reacted out of spontaneity, not because there were orders uh, uh, from the army to do so. And the most famous example is uh, Captain Maggot Boulos, uh, who you, he, he's a Coptic, he's a Christian uh, uh, officer uh, who belonged to the uh, armored uh, vehicles unit that was, uh, that was there in Tahrir. And he spontaneously, there were pictures of him just crying, you know, as like the thugs were like, you know, I mean, attacking protesters. And then he decided um, to take the initiative and started defending the square. I mean, without orders uh, from the generals. Um, if you look at like the past seven months or like, you know, from the day that the army descended on the streets on the 28th of January up until today, you have more than 12,000 Egyptians who got sentenced by military courts to prison sentences that range from 1 to 25 years and even to the death sentence. Um, you, you had the army cracking down on protests uh, in the same fashion that uh, the police used to crack down upon us uh, back in the day. Uh, prior to the revolution. We've seen the army cooperating with the police in the torturing of detainees. I mean, there are videos that are being leaked and they are posted online. And some of them I posted on my own personal blog that you can check out uh, of army officers torturing detainees. Um, so the situation uh, of the army has not really changed. Um, and I believe that we should pursue with the labor strikes until we manage to purge this army. We have to split this army. We have to get rid of the generals. Yeah. Uh, something concerning media, use of the media. Uh, we have seen from Italy an amazing use, a massive use of social networks as like Twitter, Facebook, in order to avoid, in order to keep autonomy and to keep a connection between uh, people, between organizations during the protests. Somebody talked about uh, the Twitter revolution as well. Can you explain to us uh, something a little bit, uh, what was the role of the network in the protests? And uh, I mean, was something really virtual? And there was like a crossing over between uh, internet uh, networks and uh, uh, real life? Uh, the role of the internet has been largely exaggerated in this revolution and um, I think that uh, part of why the Western press and even some in the Egyptian activist community have been trying to paint it as a Facebook revolution or like some Twitter revolution. The, the main purpose of it is to give the impression that uh, this was something peaceful done by like middle class kids, you know, I mean with blackberries, something, you know, an image that the West would absolutely love. Um, and something that does not really include much organizing on the ground. But the truth is, number one, this revolution happened not just out of the blue and not just because some activists, you know, I mean, put a Facebook event um, revolution on January 25th. So, you know, I mean, everybody just, you know, I mean, took to the streets. Uh, this is not the first time that a call for protests or a general strike uh, happened. Uh, on Facebook and it completely fizzled, didn't happen. I mean, the 6th of April group and other, you know, uh, activist group have been always uh, calling for these, like, you know, I mean, mass strikes on Facebook, which actually never happens on the ground. So why specifically January 25th? Um, you can never know when the revolutions are going to happen. 
you can never know, you can never predict. I mean, you can always sense that, you know, the country is approaching some revolutionary crisis. But if you look at history, I mean, Lenin, for example, in January 1917, he was addressing the young Bolsheviks and he was saying that it's not my generation that's going to witness the revolution, it's going to be yours. One month later, you get the revolution. And that's like, you know, I mean, Lenin, one of the greatest revolutionaries ever. Um, if you look at... Um, uh, uh, the Iranian revolution, for example, in 1979, only like one month before also, I mean, the revolution, the Shah of Iran was like, you know, I mean, out and saying that I have the sixth largest army in the world, I have the working class behind me, I cannot be toppled. And guess what? You know, I mean, they managed to overthrow him. If you recall also well the position of the U.S. administration towards the uprising in Egypt, in the beginning, Hillary Clinton went out as soon as the protest started in Egypt to assure everybody that the regime in Egypt is stable and no change is going to happen. Joe Biden, the vice president, also went on air in order to say that Mubarak is not a dictator because he's a friend of the U.S. and Israel. That's the only reason, you know, I mean, he gave at the time. Um, the revolution that happened on January 25th is like the climax or like, you know, the... the more or less like, you know, the final stage of a process that has been brewing over the past 10 years that started with the, um, with the pro-Palestine protests in 2000 that evolved into the anti-war protests in 2003 and this was the first time we ever took Tahrir Square it was in 2003, in March 2003 uh, after the Americans uh, invaded Iraq um, and then you had the labor strikes, you know, breaking out in December 2006 onwards. Uh, uh, those scenes that you've seen in Tahrir, you can find reminiscent or like similar pictures to them uh, from the previous year and the year before of like strikers and labor uh, uh, and workers just descending on the parliament, occupying the whole space around the parliament, you know, which is very close uh, to Tahrir. Now, what was the role of the internet? The internet of course did have a role i mean no one can deny that you know the internet had a role but its role was mainly publicizing what we were doing on the ground um its role was mainly disseminating information to our supporters like yourselves you know i mean abroad so that you would get connected you know with what's happening here in egypt and to help us uh, spread the message but it never really happened or on very very few occasions did it happen that Somebody like, you know, went and tweeted, let's have a demonstration now, you know, so suddenly like, you know, I mean, everybody descends because, you know, somebody uh, sent a tweet. And remember, you're talking about uh, a nation of 85 million people. Only 20 millions uh, of them have cyber access. Uh, those millions of Egyptian workers who've been striking uh, in the factories and they are the ones who brought down Mubarak, you know, I mean, in the end, by their mass strikes in the last three days and who continue to strike up until today, most of these workers are not on Facebook. Most of these workers are not on Twitter. Um, so let's not exaggerate the importance of uh, or the role that social media played. And let's also remember one other thing is that there has been unofficial marriage between social media and mainstream media on so many occasions. Uh, for example, when there was a telecommunication shutdown uh, and uh, we were without mobile phones, without SMS, without uh, internet for uh, more than like, you know, three or four days, um, how did we manage to mobilize those one million uh, man protests in Tahrir when all telecommunications uh, were shut down? Basically, whenever we agreed as organizers in Tahrir that, you know, tomorrow there will be like, you know, we need mobilization, we need more people to come, we used to write a statement and then go to the BBC office or Al Jazeera's office uh, and we know that, you know, all Egyptians watch either BBC or Al Jazeera in order to get their information about what's going on and tell them, tomorrow we're having a one million man protest in Tahrir, come over. And Al Jazeera would be like disseminating this like to millions of Egyptians that we could not have reached, you know, by the internet which was shut down then. We could not have reached by mobile phones that were shut down then. And then the following day you'll find one million people descending on Tahrir Square. Um, my blog, I'm very proud uh, to, to have it described as one of the most influential blogs in Egypt. But how many people read my blog? I mean, before the revolution, it could be as low as 200 people a day. 
after uh, and it could be as high as 1500 only and after the revolution it's anything between 12 um, like 15 uh, 1500 a day to 11000 uh, a day this is nothing compared to the 20 million uh, cyber users in Egypt or the 85 million users in Egypt but the strength of my blog and the strength of the political blogs in general come from the type of audience who check out this, the blog they are either from the activist community who will check this blog so they have their own networks on the ground that they can mobilize afterwards or the second thing are mainstream media journalists who Al Jazeera AP, Reuters, and all of these mainstream media outlets, they follow my blog, they follow the other, they follow my Twitter account, they follow other uh, 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 political bloggers in Egypt. So if I tweet about something, I am like 99% sure that this will go into Al Jazeera, which will reach at least 100 million people at the end of the day. So there was unofficial marriage. This does not mean by any sense that we consider mainstream media to be like an ally or like, you know, it's like a progressive, you know, I mean, machine. But for the kind of contradictions that exist, you know, they needed us and we used them. Okay. Just, uh, just the last question. Uh, yeah, I'm coming now. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay thank you very much. Well, last That's question. It. Okay, one last question. Yeah, just, uh, uh, yeah, very quickly. Uh, Italian politicians, when they are talking about the, the Arab Spring, uh, they are talking about uh, uh, about a democratic uh, revolution, uh, something good one. When we are talking about uh, the, the university protests that took place in Italy, they usually to divide uh, the bad ones and uh, the good ones. Uh, did you have the myth? Yeah. You know, like, um, there was a myth that this revolution in Egypt was non-violent, but it's not true. Um, in Egypt, we had 850 people who died in this uprising. They did not die like throwing flowers at the police. Um, on the Friday of anger, January 28th, how did we defeat the police? We burned down more than 190 police stations on that day. In Suez, people stormed police stations and they took AK-47s and they were fighting the police back, you know, using machine guns. In, in Northern Sinai, the North Sinai citizens, they blew up the state security police facilities using RPGs. Um, when the thugs attacked us in Tahrir, we didn't like, you know, I mean, receive them with flowers. We had, uh, we had Molotov cocktails, we had rocks, we had swords, we had knives in order to protect ourselves. The popular committees that, you know, sprang all over Egypt in order to protect the neighborhoods, many of those popular committees were armed with guns and machine guns and swords and knives and there were clashes on so many uh, occasions. But, is, but it is in the interest of the regime in Egypt and the army generals and the Americans in order to portray this as like, you know, a Facebook Blackberry revolution, you know, where like, you know, everybody was like, you know, singing and, you know, I mean, holding hands, no violence, you know, I mean, whatsoever, because they are worried about the, con the, about the uh, uh, consequences. I am not a violent person. I don't like violence for the sake of violence, but I'm very realistic. And I understand that across history, once you get a revolution, and once a ruling elite is threatened, these ruling elites are not just going to give up power just like that. They will use every single bullet they have and every trick in the book in order to stay in power. And as for the people, they have to defend themselves. Okay. Thank you, Assam. Have a nice time. The pleasure was all mine. Thank you a lot. Good luck to you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hi. Hi. Can I take two minutes outside? Um, <laughs> you know, I'm...